Good morning, and welcome to another installment of The Angry Astronaut. It shouldn't come as much as a surprise to any of you that I am especially pissed off right now. Why? Well, I had a very specific video in mind, all planned out, a whole topic all ready to share with you, when all of a sudden, this happened. Now this stunning but sad footage is provided courtesy of Boca Chica Gal, who covers these events second to none. Now she documents both the inspiring and the depressing aspects of this project with an amazing amount of dedication. And so I have her site linked in the description of this video and I encourage you to go there and subscribe. Now something that I really didn't expect is that one of our subscribers a few weeks ago who has over 40 years worth of welding experience on stainless steel structures expressed a couple of concerns about the Starship project on my channel. And so I shared these concerns on Scott Manley's most recent video and he actually responded. Scott Manley, who has a billion times more subscribers than I do, and is far more respected in the field of space flight on YouTube and elsewhere, he responded, and he was interested in this person's opinion. And so, I reached out to this individual, and he responded very quickly, and hopefully the two of them are talking now. It would be interesting indeed if one of my subscribers would, in some small way, contribute to solving some of the problems that the Starship is having. But let me make one thing perfectly clear. I'm not going to talk about my speculations as to what went wrong. There's a lot of information out there about that. What does matter is when these sorts of things happen, with this build and break philosophy that SpaceX has. There's this idea that it doesn't matter, that we'll have another prototype coming in no time, and that's how we learn. Well, I tend to disagree, at least to some extent. I think it does matter, because the construction crews who are active participants in this project who believe, or at least have been told, that the project that they're working on is going to change the future of humanity, change the future of manned spaceflight, and for them to watch all of those man hours crumple up like a bunch of tin foil, that's just got to be demoralizing. So at least in that regard, it does matter. And it's my sincere hope that on this next prototype, SpaceX slows down just a little bit and checks off a few more inspections of what they're about to test before they wreck another prototype. It's my hope that this prototype is actually going to take to the skies or at least have a static fire test. Time will tell, but I do have faith just to be clear, I have faith that the Starship will eventually be a success. But all of this acts as a segue into the topic of what I wanted to talk about. Is SpaceX the most innovative space company out there? Well, in terms of rockets, I would say absolutely yes. But in terms of what goes on top of a rocket... The other aspects of space flight that are going to take us to the moon, expand our presence in orbit, and even take us all the way to Mars, there's another company that matches up with SpaceX and may even be more innovative. Who are they? Stay tuned for a moment.
No, I don't want to talk about these assholes. Get rid of that logo. Now? Now? Yeah, I want to talk about these guys instead. And I've talked about them before, but I want to go into depth. Started, or rather acquired, in 1994 by Fata and Armin Osman, and I probably butchered their names, they built this company from a dozen people into a huge space flight powerhouse. Now their most famous ship, the Dream Chaser, is designed to fit snugly inside the fairings of the Vulcan rocket system. Now using a ULA rocket would normally piss me off, but apparently ULA has finally decided to embrace reusability and 70% of the cost, the engines, are going to be reusable on this particular craft. But check this out. Reusable or not, that's cool. Those fairings on the Vulcan are designed to protect the Dream Chaser from any damage that it may take from debris at takeoff or heading into orbit. Now that curious device on the tail is called the Shooting Star. It's a cargo module that allows the Dream Chaser to carry a total of 10,000 kilograms worth of cargo to the ISS versus 6,000 for the Dragon. Believe it or not, using a small ion engine, the Shooting Star is capable of reaching the Lunar Gateway, providing 4,500 kilograms worth of cargo to resupply the astronauts on that station. High reusability, as you can see, and here's another advantage. The ship re-enters the atmosphere at a very gentle angle, so the G-forces are very moderate, only about one and a half Gs, and it can land on just about any airfield across the planet. And since it is such a gentle landing, very delicate experiments can be delivered and easily recovered, much easier than a space capsule. But why watch computer animations? Let's have a look at the Dream Chaser during a landing test dropped from a helicopter. And keep in mind, there is no pilot in this vessel. And by the way, the Dream Chaser Shooting Star combination have secured contracts to resupply both the ISS and the Lunar Gateway from NASA but for some reason hasn't gotten a whole lot of press coverage outside of Nevada and Colorado. And by the way, there will soon be a crewed version of this ship capable of carrying seven astronauts that somehow lost out to the Boeing Starliner, which seems only capable of going into the wrong orbit, nearly crashing twice, and having so many glitches that Bill Gates thought that it had Windows Vista installed on the thing. Okay, that was a joke, but check out this perfect landing. Just gorgeous. Quite an amazing ship. And only one of the tricks that Sierra Nevada has. Well, you've seen this before too, but let's have a look at this ship a little bit more in detail. Originally, this was designed to be the Lunar Gateway, or at least part of it. But now, this is Sierra Nevada's method of taking us to Mars. As I've mentioned in the past, it has only four modules. It's very simple, and yet more than capable of taking four astronauts to the Red Planet comprised of an inflatable habitation module and the whole ship can be folded up and fit into the fairing of a single Falcon Heavy. So once the ship arrives at the Lunar Gateway, picks up its passengers and can easily escape the influence of Earth's gravity from that location, it starts its journey. Now this is the propulsion, a very innovative design, solar electric. The solar panels generate 17 kilowatts of positive energy and then those protons are driven out the back by a negatively charged electromagnet, thus generating thrust. 
Not a lot of thrust, but thrust that goes on for days and days instead of a few minutes, and more than capable of taking the ship to the red planet in short order. Now here's the inflatable environmental unit for habitation. And it's comprised of layers of urethane, nylon, and Vectran for insulation from space and also radiation protection. Also has a very large amount of volume. As I said before, one-third the volume of the International Space Station, or 10,000 cubic feet, finally got that right, or 300 cubic meters. And that's big enough for a science lab, a microgravity garden, a medical bay, individual crew quarters, and a bathroom, and a galley. And then finally we have the logistics and control module. And this was adapted from the Dream Chaser. Essentially for cargo, plus multiple airlocks. All of this is modular, by the way. So it can be assembled in different configurations and made into a larger ship should that be desired. So if you're a super nerd and want further detail, here's an interior diagram laying out how the space within the inflatable module could be used. And now let's have a look at the real thing, or at least a mock-up of the interior of the inflatable habitat and the command module. But once you arrive at Mars, how is this ship supposed to get you down to the surface? Well, Sierra Nevada has some ideas for reusable landers, but another possibility is to use the moon of Phobos. A small base could be established, perhaps with another inflatable module, and equipped with reusable landers. And since the moon orbits the planet three times a day, you would have a wide variety of choices for landing sites, and waiting for you, at least at one of those sites, would be 3D printed buildings, such as this concept of the Marsha, which I've mentioned in previous videos. Now, obviously, I kind of simplified that last part in terms of the landers. I think that Sierra Nevada will be counting on some other partners in order to complete that part of the mission. But really what I wanted to do was just simply show you just how innovative this company is, how many new and original concepts they have. Instead of reusing space capsules like the Apollo, everybody else seems to be going that way, they're sticking with a space plane, something like the space shuttle, except making it better. Instead of using rockets to go to Mars, they're using solar electric power. Just an amazing amount of innovations. And really, this company deserves more attention and more contracts from NASA in order to continue manned exploration of space. At least that's the way I see it. And here's your hidden challenge, by the way. Can you come up with some other companies that you think are every bit as innovative as Sierra Nevada? I'm sure they're out there. But in the meantime, it's getting extremely late. I'm about to run out of energy, but I've still got enough left to say, stay angry about space.